Okay. Let's start. Today we will discuss about uh, Ivanhoe, uh, the historical romance or historical novel prescribed uh, in your syllabus in Unit 4. Ivanhoe, written by Sir Walter Scott. Uh, in this lecture, we'll discuss about Sir Walter Scott, the Scottish writer, historical writer, and uh, we'll discuss about the context and background of this historical romance, Ivanhoe. Yes. One, one, once more, uh, am I audible? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, so uh, Sir Walter Scott was a Scottish historical novelist. He's known as a historical novelist, uh, executive, uh, especially for historical writings. Um, he was a poet, he was a playwright, and he was an historian also. Many of his works remain classics of European and Scottish literature. literature. He was uh, the president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Uh, Royal Society of Edinburgh was Scotland's national academy for science and letters. And it's, it was a registered charity. And it used to serve the public uh, uh, unbiasedly and uh, equally uh, for the public benefit. And uh, there are more than 1,000 fellow of uh, this uh, uh, academic, academy, Royal Society of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, so Walter Scott suffered from many uh, physical ailments in his childhood. It is said that he was uh, suffering from polio uh, in his childhood and because of which uh, he literally became lame and uh, physically very weak. And this is one of the reasons that uh, he was pushed into uh, academic pursuits. In his own words, he said that he became the glutton of books, you know, and uh, before start, uh, start writing this novel, uh, Ivanhoe, he seriously fell ill. And most of the parts of this uh, Ivanhoe, this uh, historical romance, he wrote from his uh, sick bed. <clears throat> the notable novels written by Walter Scott uh, are Ivanhoe, Rob Roy, uh, Waverly, Old uh, Mortality, The Heart of Maid Lothian, uh, and The Bride of uh, Lammermoor, and the narrative poems, The Lady of the Lake and Marmion. Uh, this is the image of the Royal Society building at the junction of George Street uh, and uh, Hanover Street in Newtown, Edinburgh. This is the Royal Society, the academic, na Scotland's na National Academy, where uh, Mr. Walter Scott was the president. Uh, influence on Gothic novel. Sir Walter Scott was greatly influenced by the Gothic novel, which is also known as Gothic horror. As we know that uh, uh, the Gothic horror novel, this is one of the genre of uh, fiction, which deals with horror, death, and sometimes romance also. And uh, Scott was influenced by Gothic romance and had collaborated in uh, 1801 with the uh, monk Matthew Lewis on Tales of Wonder. Let me tell you that uh, Matthew Lewis was uh, a, a, an English writer or historian. His writings are basically known as Gothic horror. And sometimes he's referred to as uh, the monk Lewis uh, because of his novel entitled The Monk, which became very, uh, very successful. And it was the Gothic horror. So um, uh, Scott was very much influenced by Gothic romance and he collaborated with Matthew Lewis uh, in 1800. One with the monk. Knowledge of history. Uh, Walter Scott had great knowledge of history. He read history avidly, and uh, Scott was uh, an almost exclusively historical novelist. And uh, he had this passion for history. 
and he was very passionate about depicting the scenery which uh, had castle or battlefield and his passion for this you know uh, history historical uh, events and incidents uh, made him uh, made it easy for him to romanticize it so we find a very uh, great combination of history and romance in his uh, novels uh, his friend mr morit of uh, roxbury said of him he was but half satisfied with the most beautiful scenery when it could not connect it with some local legend uh, one of his uh, one of the critics henry beer says uh, he possesses the true and gentle wand the historic imagination with this uh, in his hand he raised the dead past to life made it once more conceivable made it even actual yes so um, he had this great knowledge of history his writings are known as uh, historical writings historical novels uh influence of shakespeare and chaucer uh sir walter scott was greatly influenced by shakespeare and chaucer also sometimes he is also referred to as a student of shakespeare uh because of uh, you know many uh, quotations he has uh, taken from shakespeare's writing in his novels at the same time you will find that there are many uh, uh, many characters in his novels uh, which are uh, which bear resemblance to the characters uh, uh, of shakespeare in his uh, plays for example there is a resemblance with uh, shakespeare's king john to prince john of avignon prince john is a character in avignon that we will do in detail uh, later so uh, uh, prince john in avignon has this resemblance with king john by shakespeare uh, there are other characters like isaac jessica the reminders of uh, shylock and jessica of merchant of venice uh, written by shakespeare similarly wamba Uh, uh the character the fool uh in uh, the plays like king lear 12th night do resemble uh, uh to the fools okay uh, and, and we find the similar characters in uh, ivan who and other 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 novels of uh, you know, sir walter scott as well so uh the next point is historical romance yeah here we need to understand the concept of historical moment and uh, romance because walter scott has uh, written historical novels which are also known as historical novels his writings are uh, known as historical romance so uh, historical romance also historical novel is a broad category of fiction in which the plot takes place in a setting located in past this is very important uh, to understand the romantic uh, the historical romance the most important point about is uh, it is that the the plot takes place in a setting located in the past and uh, walter scott helped popularize this genre in uh, the early 19th century with works such as rob roy and ivan book yes uh, here uh, the word romance you know the romance is little ambiguous uh, because uh, the word romance uh, has many different meanings sometimes some people related to the uh, to the you know uh, to the very basic understanding of this word that is the romantic relationship between man and woman it is also known as harlequin romance har harlequin uh, love about men and women but uh, romance can uh, can also be defined as a fictitious narrative in prose or verse uh the interest of which turns upon our marvelous and uncommon incidents yes uh it is also no romance also means a novel or a fictitious narrative it can be in the form of prose or uh verse and it focuses on the adventurous deeds the marvelous and common incidents uh, of history uh in the novel so this is also known as romance and yeah walter scott was very adept at uh, combining these two elements the history and the romance because he was very passionate about this historical uh, events and places and it made him uh, made it easier for him to romanticize those events so you will find a very great combination of uh, the history and the romance uh, romance in the sense sometimes so the daring do that means the adventurous deeds of the heroes and uh, sometimes the 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 uh, intrigue of uh, you know the the uh, love affairs also so this kind of elements you find this combination uh, in the historical romances of walter scott uh ivanhoe 
let's talk about the Ivanhoe, which was written in 1819. Uh, it was a historical romance or historical novel that we just have seen. Uh, as we have seen again, uh, historical romance or historical novel is a broad party category of fiction in which the plot takes place in a setting located in the past. Walter Scott helped popularize the genre in early 19th century with works such as Rob Roy and Ivanhoe. Romance here uh, in this novel that we are going to read in detail refers as much to daring do and the intrigue as to courtship and uh, love. Uh, let's see the setting in Ivanhoe. <clears throat> uh, the action yeah, in Ivanhoe, the setting here I'm talking about, takes place in England in uh, summer of 1194. 1194. Uh, it means it was a uh, uh, Middle Ages. Okay. The action takes place in England in summer 1194, during Middle, Middle Ages in England, when the nation's illustrious warrior king Richard I returns to his homeland from the Third Crusade in the Holy Land. Uh, Scott describes a specific local in northern England, is not present day Man Manchester, in the opening paragraph. So, as we have seen that the romantic uh, historical romance or historical novel is the one in which the setting uh, takes place uh, in past. Okay, it talks about some past incident, historical incident. So, here also uh, uh, the setting in Ivanhoe takes place back uh, in 1194 in Middle Ages in summer. And uh, it starts with uh, uh, an illustrious uh, warrior, King Richard I. Uh, he is coming back from the crusade, the third crusade in Holy Land. I'll tell you in detail what the crusade and Holy Land, uh, all these concepts are. So he's coming back uh, to his nation. And uh, Scott describes this specific local, you know, in uh, Northern England, East of present in Manchester in the opening paragraph itself, that uh, uh, from which we can, uh, we can, come to the conclusion that it is a historical uh, novel or historical romance. Uh, let me read out the first uh, paragraph uh, 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 in the novel that talks about the local, the setting of the, of the novel. Uh, in that pleasant district of Mary England, which is watered by the river Dawn, there extended in ancient times a large forest covering the greater part of the beautiful hills and valleys which lie between Sheffield and the pleasant town of Doncaster. The remains of this extensive wood are still to be seen at the noble seas of Wentworth, of One Cliff Park, and around Rotherham. Here haunted of yore, the fabulous dragon of Wantley. Here were fought many of the most desperate battles during the civil wars of the Roses, and here also flourished in ancient times those bands of gallant outlaws whose deeds have been rendered so popular in English song. So all these places, Sheffield, uh, Doncaster, Wentworth, Wancliffe Park, Rotherham, it, uh, these are the places, you know, he describes a specific local here in Northern England, east of present day Manchester, where this um, setting takes place, the action takes place, okay. That makes it a historical novel. Mm. Yeah. Uh, historical fiction, uh, historical novel here uh, is a map of Northern England where the action of this novel takes place. Scott says this action in his historical towns such as Sheffield and Ashby and, and uh, in fictional towns such as uh, Templestowe and Rotherwood. There are some fictional towns also, apart from the historical places in England, in northern England. And today they are the east of uh, Manchester in England. Now, let's talk about some important concepts, or uh, we can say uh, the terms that we come across uh, in this novel. And to understand the background, the context, we need to understand this term, this concept, con concepts of. Uh, concept that we come across in this novel. The very first one that I would like to elucidate here is the crusade. One of the religious wars 
uh, fought by Christians, uh, mostly against Muslims in Palestine in 11th, 12th, 13th, and 17th century. As we have seen that the novel begins with the King Richard uh, I, who is coming back to his nation from the third crusade that take, takes place in the Holy Land of uh, Israel. So uh, crusade is one of the religious wars. Okay, it was fought between uh, the Christians and the Muslims and uh, the Holy Land Israel. Why you know, it is important for the Christians, the Muslims, at the same time, the Jews, you know, uh, uh, we will talk about that. The Holy Land uh, 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 that is uh, mentioned here in this novel uh, is a term which, is, which in Judaism refers to the land of Israel. So here the Holy Land is the land of Israel. Uh, part of the significance of the land stems from the religious significance of uh, Jerusalem, uh, the holiest city to Judaism, the assumed place of Jesus' ministry, uh, and the Israel Miraz event in Islam. So uh, this holy land, the land of Israel, uh, has uh, religious significance for the Christians also, for the Muslims also, and for the Jews also. That means uh, these three religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Muslim. Islam. Uh, in all these three religions, this holy land, land of Israel, you now has a significant religious significance. Um, Jerusalem is considered a sacred site in Islamic tradition, along with Mecca and Med Medina. Islamic tradition holds that previous prophets were associated with the city and that the Islamic prophet Muhammad visited the city on a nocturnal journey. Due to such significance, it was the first Qibla direction of prayer for Muslims and the Prophet Muhammad designated the al Aska for pilgrimage. So let's talk about the significance of this holy land, land of Israel in Islam. It is said that uh, the Islamic prophet, Prophet Muhammad, uh, he, he went on a journey, okay, and it was a nocturnal journey, a night journey in which and this journey was physical also and spiritual also it is said that he uh, traveled on the back on the mule like creature the winged creature white mule uh, it is one of the we can say like the species of horse he uh, traveled on the back of this creature um, to the farthest mosque you know in israel which is situated in israel and uh, it is known as al aska uh, Al-Aqsa uh, uh, Mosque in the Israel, the Holy Land. And it is said that Prophet Muhammad uh, led other uh, prophets in the prayer in this place. And therefore, uh, uh, Al-Aqsa uh, is a, a very important uh, religious place uh, in Israel for Muslims. So they claim uh, uh, this place as their, uh, you know, uh, religious place. Okay. So, uh, uh, yes. And Isra and Miraz, these are the two parts of, you know, uh, parts which re, uh, give the details, you know, recount this story, the journey of uh, uh, Muhammad Prophet, uh, Prophet Muhammad uh, on these places. And from there, he uh, ascended to heaven. So, you know, these dates of his uh, um, ascent to heaven and his journey to uh, this religious place, uh, this mosque in Israel are very important there's in the calendar, uh, calendar or Islamic calendar. So in this way, uh, this holy land uh, are um, as important uh, as Mecca and Medina for the, the Muslims. Okay. Uh, this is a place, uh, the Al-Aqsa mosque in Israel, the holy land, okay, for the Muslims. Now let's talk about uh, the Christianity. Why this holy land, the land of Israel, is important for Christians? Uh, it is said that uh, Jesus Christ brought, brought into this place as a child. Uh, he preached there, he healed there. And it is also said uh, in some, uh, you know, uh, uh, scriptures that uh, he had his last supper in the upper room of Israel. And he faced uh, the... the you know, trial and crucifixion and his resurrection. All these uh, incidents uh, took place in this uh, holy land. Okay. And in Christian faith, Jerusalem's place in the life of Jesus gives it great import importance. 
in addition to its place in the Old Testament. So uh, this is the place, uh, this is the image of the garden of uh, Gethesman, uh, in which uh, Jesus Christ was arrested and he went to the trial and crucifixion, resurrection, all these incidences took place in this holy land. And therefore, uh, this la holy land or land of Israel is uh, religiously very significant for the Christians. So Christians and Muslims both claim for this place as their their religious places. Uh, similarly, let's talk about Judaism. In Judaism, uh, that is for Jews. Uh, this place is very important uh, because uh, they have this, uh, you know, sacred temple of their their religious temple in this uh, holy land. And but they differ from the Christians, you know, the Jews differ from the Christians in their religious belief, uh, as they believe that Jesus Christ uh, is not the Messiah as the Christians believe, and they uh, have their faith in the God, the Father of Jesus Christ. So um, Christian, the Christians and the Jews, they are also at cross uh, in terms of their religious beliefs. So um, uh, Holy Land, the land of Israel is uh, religiously significant for Christians, for Muslims and for the Jews as well. Um, and all these are the, uh, the terms, the concepts that we will come across when we will go through the plots of the novel Ivanhoe. Uh, now let, let me tell you about Norman Conquest, a, a very important historical event that took place in, uh, in England. So the Norman Conquest of England in Britain, often called the Norman Conquest or the Conquest, was the 11th century invasion and occupation of England by an army of Norman, Britain, Flemish and French soldiers, especially French soldiers, uh, led by the Duke of Normandy, later styled uh, William the Conqueror. So uh, here, uh, let me read out the next paragraph, then I'll explain it to you. Uh, William's claim to the English throne derived from his familiar relationship with the childless Anglo-Saxon King Edward, the Confessor, who may have encouraged William's hopes for the throne. Edward died in uh, January uh, 1066 and was succeeded by his brother-in-law, Harold Godwin. So this is the historical details uh, about the Norman Conquest and the Anglo-Saxons. Anglo-Saxon was a cultural group, you know, uh, that uh, uh, inhabited in Great Britain from 5th century. And uh, Anglo-Saxons, these were the groups which uh, descended from the Germanic tribes and they traveled from the European continent. And uh, the de descendants of this Anglo-Saxon uh, group or uh, indigenous people of Great Britain, they established the foundation of the English society. And uh, the modern English legal system and the modern English uh, society, most of the aspects are derived from the Anglo-Saxon culture. And uh, in the modern English uh, language, uh, we'll find that more than over half of the words that we use in day to day speech of English languages are in the English language are derived from the Anglo Saxon uh, language. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> after uh, that, uh, in the uh, uh, 11th century, okay, uh, there was this event took place Norman conquest of England, the French soldiers. Uh, the Normans, uh, they took over the Anglo-Saxon and therefore there was a kind of this conflict, friction between the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons. Okay, and um, uh, Edward, uh, it was the Anglo-Saxon king, okay, when he died, the Norman king, you know, the William, he took over and uh, he succeeded uh, by his brother-in-law, Harold. Godwin. So this is, this is these are the historical details that we uh, need to know uh, before uh, getting into the details of the novel Ivanhoe. Now this novel Ivanhoe is actually based upon three important conflicts. There are two important conflicts uh, around which the whole plot the story uh, devolves. The novel centers on general conflict, uh, the normal rulers of England and the native sections. Okay, so the conflict on the broader context, if we talk about, there is a conflict between the normal rulers and the Anglo-Saxons. Okay, and here I will know, Prince John, 
he belongs to the anglo anglo saxon group okay and richard the first he is a norman so the conflict between Norm normans and the saxons and the second conflict uh, that is on the personal level between the individuals notably the conflict between ivanhoe and his father so there are these two conflicts that we have to focus on in this novel Yes. Now let's talk about the point of view. Scott tells the story in third person point of view. However, he occasionally assumes the persona of a storyteller and historian, uh, using the first person pronoun I as in the following passage. So this uh, story is uh, told in third person from third person point of view, but sometimes uh, uh, what does Scott uh, he uses the pronouns like I and uh, uh, he assumes the persona of a storyteller or a historian in the novel. So let, let me read out this, uh, this paragraph from chapter one. The state of uh, things I have thought is necessary to premise for the information of the general reader who might be apt to forget that although no great historical events such as war or uh, insurrection mark the existence of the Anglo-Saxons as a separate people subsequent to the reign of William II. Yet the great national distinctions betwixt them and their conquerors, the recollection of what they had formerly been and to what they were now reduced, continued down to the reign of Edward III to keep open the wounds which the conquest had inflicted and to maintain a line of separation between the betwixt the descendants of the Victor Normans and the vanquished Saxons. So here he's using the pronoun I as if he is an historian and telling the, the story of the historical events. And uh, he was uh, very adept uh, in recreating the historical events uh, with vivid details. And the setting uh, appeared to be very authentic with his uh, skills. So in this paragraph, we are coming, we are coming across uh, the conflict between the Normans and the Anglo-Saxons. That is one of the themes of this novel. So um, here we come to an end of this presentation uh, where we have discussed about the context and uh, about uh, historical writer Sir Walter Scott. Uh, in the next lecture, we'll discuss about the plot of the novel. So here I would like to stop. Thank you so much for joining. Good morning. Thank you.